thank you for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. I hope it will be interesting to uh, a good portion of the audience. So I, I, I try to make it accessible also for people that are not experts in uh, the specific topic that, I, that I'm covering. And uh, um, so um, when you are dealing with modeling any, any object, even understanding it at a fundamental level, uh, we now know that uh, master may look continuous when you look at it. And you may think that you can subdivide it further and further and further. But at some point, we now know that you reach a situation where there are uh, structures that cannot be further discretized. There may be uh, clusters, for example, that, that, that are, for example, if you look at the, uh, the liquid, there are molecules uh, that are mixed within the, the liquid. And for example, in the case of biological matter, there, there, there are uh, molecules inside which you can uh, treat as individual objects. Or if you go further down the level, you know that they are made of atoms. And if you look at the atoms, they are made of electrons and ions. And the ions are made of different types of nucleons, neutrons and uh, protons, and so forth. You can keep going and the structure becomes more and more complicated. So often you are dealing with systems where you have to consider these different levels of description at the same time. You may need to have a dis uh, continuous description where you treat your object as a continuum. Uh, but locally, there may be some physics process that require you to remember that there are actually particles there, atoms, electrons, ions, protons, neutrons, and so forth. Um, this is true for everything from uh, modeling the coronavirus to modeling a galaxy. I will do in the latter, so I'm uh, uh, looking at space weather. So what's just very briefly what space weather is, is, is the impact that the sun has on the Earth. There's uh, a continuous solar wind coming out of the sun. It's very dynamical, and there are storms in it. Some of these storms arrive at the Earth and uh, can be a serious threat to our technology, not to humans on the ground, but to humans in space, and but especially to the technology. And uh, there are two types of, of, of dangers. One is coming from the electromagnetic fields, which you can consider a continuum. But uh, also uh, there is uh, particles, there are uh, high energy particles that uh, basically are radiation that can uh, damage the technology and also of course uh, damage uh, the cells of the body of the astronauts. Um, as I said, uh, on, the, on the ground on Earth there is no real danger for humans. Uh, this uh, type of, uh, of threat is uh, actually a very serious one. You may think, okay, well, you know, it's not a big deal. We are dealing with a much more serious problem right now, so space weather is not that important. But it turns out that that's not the case. Uh, there was one famous event in 1859 uh, that statistically is considered to be happening uh, every 100 years. So uh, the next one is clearly well overdue. But Carrington was a scientist, a kind of founding father of this uh, uh, discipline. that was already observing the sun then, and he observed this major storm, the now it's called the Carrington event, it was September 1 to 2, uh, 1859. It lasted several days. And at that time, he only disrupted the, te the telegraph lines. Uh, it caused serious, serious damages to some stations. There were fires and interruption of communication for a while. But at that time, there was no radio, there was no uh, satellite technology, no electrical grid. Uh, that's most important, the electrical grid. You know, if we are without the electrical grid for an extended period, uh, that is a very serious concern. So in fact, uh, there was a pretty uh, accurate, I would say, estimate of what the natural hazards that we should be worried about that was done in 2019 by the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States and identify only two threats that really can affect a nation wide or even the earth as a, as a whole. One was the pandemic, and on that one they were very, very accurate. And then there is also space weather. So those are the two things that can disrupt the human technology on a global level uh, in a very serious way. Because it can essentially uh, damage the grid uh, to a degree that uh, we will be without power for several months. So then, when you want to study this system, you are dealing with something that is called a plasma. Uh, the space uh, weather is filled with this, uh, with this uh, solar wind. The solar wind is actually made of a plasma. Plasma is like a gas, 
But when uh, it's so hot that uh, the electrons become detached from the from the ions, so the atoms uh, break into their components, the, the, the nuclei uh, on one side, the, the, which in the case of solar wind is mostly hydrogen, so it's a, it's a proton, and uh, the electrons. And they move around. Uh, the description of this system, like I said at the beginning, can be done at different levels. You can do this at a, at a continuum level. You consider the solar wind as if it was a, uh, a continuum, and that's very good description when you're dealing with the electric field and magnetic field, with the disruptions that happen at the magnetic level. But when you're dealing with high energy particles, that's not a good description. Uh, if you want to be accurate on, on predicting uh, what kind of radioactivity levels that will be reached, uh, reaching the astronauts, for example, you need to go to a better description than just a continuum. One description is a single particle level, but that's, of course, uh, there are so many particles moving around in the solar system that's not really doable. And then there is a kinetic approach, which is a statistical approach. And you, you, you describe the particles in the solar system statistically. You want to know what is their velocity distribution in a given location. And that's a description that is suitable for, for, uh, for space weather. And, and finally, the fluid approach is the continuum approach, where you where you study the, the, the solar wind as if it was a flow of water with the same model. Uh, besides the application to, uh, to space weather and astrophysics, uh, plasmas are very important also in laboratory, uh, in the industry, in the medical uh, sector for treating, for example, skin cancer. Um, the computer that is being built, Lumi, uh, will have uh, components there that were built in a, in, a, in a chamber where a plasma was straight in the surface uh, that then uh, goes into the GPU or the CPU. So the plasmas are very important also in that uh, aspect. And what you're seeing there is an example of a fusion device. It's a spherical tokamak in, uh, in Korea uh, that um, mm, is simulated with the same tools that we were using to simulate the space weather. So it's a space, uh, as many other applications, the same model that we're describing today, apply to all these other systems. So uh, the challenge then is how do we bring these two types of description, the fluid description and the kinetic description. Here I have Lagrange for the fluid description and Boltzmann, which is the father of kinetic theory. Uh, how do we bring them to, to a supercomputer? And that's what I'm trying to describe. So when you, when you do a fluid approach, maybe more people are familiar with that, you are you are dealing with fluid equations, so you have a continuum that is described by some local quantities like the density, the temperature, the velocity. These are quantities that we are used to. Uh, when you look at the weather forecast in the evening, uh, Frank or whoever replaces Frank is going uh, to uh, describe what is the uh, pressure, for example. It tells you high pressure, low, low pressure coming. Those are fluid models. Same applies to space weather. Uh, fluid models then will be something that looks like that. There will be a computational grid. And in each uh, cell, you will have a certain uh, information about the local properties of the system. The kinetic description instead, uh, it has that description. Uh, so locally wants to know, for example, in each cell, what is the electric field, what is the magnetic field uh, properties, but it also has on top of that, a distribution of particles. So that's actually very interesting for a computer because now you have two agents. You have the grid like any other uh, computer model, but you also have particles, and their number, though, is not constant because it depends. Some regions will have more particles, other regions will have fewer particles, and there are particles of electron type or particles of ion type. They may not be the same, uh, the same number. So uh, you have a complexity that is also interesting from a computer science point of view because it allows you to have more degrees of freedom in what you do with the CPUs and GPUs. And I will return to this in a moment. But it's, of course, a complexity. You have to deal with all these particles. However, the particles are relatively simple objects, so you have a very parallelizable system because now you have a tremendous number of particles. We are talking maybe hundreds of billions in modern simulation, trillions of particles. Each one does its own job, so it can be parallelized uh, 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 very straightforwardly, but uh, there is communication because, of course, the particles interact. Uh, so that uh, is, is kind of the, the, the mother of all the problems in parallel computing site. Right? You, know, you have all the ingredients, uh, which makes Peak uh, historically one of the most successful applications on supercomputers. They were the first application to prove uh, performance at the uh, petabyte level, and hopefully they will also at the exascale level. Uh, so uh, when you are dealing with the particle in cell methods, so you have a particle and you have a grid, 
you have to deal with these four operations. You have to move the particles using the fields that are present on the grid. So you have to interpolate the fields to the particle position. Then you move the particles, and now you take the particle. The particles is the source of the fields. Right? The particles moving produce current. Currents produce magnetic field. Particles also have a charge and produce electric fields. So those are the sources. And then you have to interpolate these sources to the grid, compute the fields on the grid, and now you are ready to give the fields back to the particle. So there are these four operations you have to repeat in a cycle. If you do this explicitly, so you do each operation one at a time in a sequence, you move the particles, you interpolate it to the grid, compute the fields, interpolate the fields to the grid, to the particle, these four steps in sequence, uh, introduce a severe limitation on the resolution you can use. You have to use a tremendously large resolution just so that the system stays stable. Because, of course, in nature, these four operations are done all at the same time. A particle moves and the fields are evolving at the same time. You cannot break this uh, link. But in a simulation of the explicit type, you do break this link. You do an unphysical operation by breaking this link. And that operation is only valid if you have a tremendously small time step and also a tremendously large uh, resolution. So at a very, very fine resolution with very small grid spacing. If that is the case, those are some uh, more technical limits that for the experts that relate the, the physical scales of the system with the resolution you have to have. If you do that, the system works very well. And, and this is a tremendously simple way to treat a plasma. But of course, it's also a very uh, time consuming because you have to resolve this tremendous scale. Uh, the, the killer, really, is uh, what is called a, a final grid instability. So it's a lack of energy conservation. The fact that you're breaking the link between the electric field, magnetic field, and the particle motion means that the energy is no longer conserved. Not exactly. So if your time step is very small, and if the resolution is very small, it is conserved. But if not, it's not conserved. So you see here in blue that when your resolution starts to become larger, so you have a larger cell and a larger time step, energy goes crazy. I use the reproduction index RT since we are now all uh, very uh, familiar with the concept of RT. So how the energy reproduces itself, it shouldn't, energy should be conserved. But instead, uh, because of this numerical trick of breaking the link with the electromagnetic field and particles, energy is actually increasing itself. It's, it's exponentially growing if you don't resolve this case. Uh, when you express it at some point, this uh, takes off and uh, the reproduction index is from zero, starts to become uh, positive. And you must avoid that because uh, the system will grow in energy without any real source for it. So it goes crazy. There is a way around that, and that is to avoid breaking the link between particles and fields. So to, to make, in my opinion, the best use of the modern computers, you, you want to go beyond this explicit method that, that fixes uh, the scales, but you want to go to a more advanced scheme that conserves energy. Uh, so uh, this scheme is called implicit. Implicit means that you move in the particles and advance in the field together. Together means there is an iteration. A, 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 for the mathematicians, or uh, let's say the expert in, in, in scientific computing among you, is the Newton iteration for solving a nonlinear equation. So you have to do that if you want to conserve the energy. Of course, that's very costly. And uh, over my career, let's say, this uh, summarizes my career, uh, I've been always working in making this uh, progressively more efficient. Uh, this work started with the implicit moment method that was developed at Los Alamos by Bradbill and Forslund. And uh, then I, I worked at Los Alamos for, for 15 years. And when I was there, I developed uh, Celeste. And then I started to develop IPIC3D, but then I moved to Leuven, and IPIC3D was developed in Leuven by myself and uh, my postdoc at that time, Stefano Marchidis, that also had been in Los Alamos with me, and came to Leuven. And then now in Exim, and uh, we are now looking forward to this application to machines like Lumi for the CPU and GPU uh, coupling. So now I'm going to describe what this uh, approach is that makes possible to do much larger simulations uh, in these modern supercomputers. So like I said, the critical point is to keep the motion of the particles and the advancement of the electromagnetic field together so that you don't break uh, the link. Uh, you can do this uh, directly with Newton iteration, but if you do this on a trillion particles, you have a system of uh, trillions of, of equations that are nonlinearly coupled and need the Newton-Krillow iteration. Uh, that's extremely expensive. 
so uh, it, it, there are some examples of uh, this happening uh, some some test calls especially on on shared memory computers but there is no example of a, uh, such a code for a distributed memory massively parallel computer too complicated so we have uh, when i was at los alamos like i said i started from the this method that introduces a, a, an idea i say okay for the fields i am using a grid so what i need from the particle is only the information of what the particles will contribute to the grid so if i can get the guess of that without actually have to move the particles i can i can still break the link but i do it in a smarter way than with the explicit method this is called semi implicit and uh, with the method that was developed uh, at los alamos by my predecessors and by myself this unfortunately still does not conserve the energy exactly but it improves the constraints uh, very significantly this is the approach that is behind ip3 but more recently in the last couple of years we developed a new method that describes this contribution of the particles to the grid exactly there is no longer any approximation it does it exactly using a concept a mathematical concept called mass matrix there is a matrix that expresses the contribution of the part of the, of the particles to the grid i'm not of course going to uh, bore you with all the mathematical details but it all boils down like the equation that is in the picture uh, so it's, it's, you, know, you have to build this big matrix, uh, but once you do that, then the system conserves energy exactly to a same precision, and there is no instability. So what happens is something like this. Uh, when you are dealing with a system, uh, if you do this explicitly as a blur, blue curve, uh, at some uh, re very small resolution, uh, the system starts to lose energy conservation. If you go to the same implicit method of the older type, this happens still, but much later, at much higher resolution. So you can have a much larger cell and much longer time step. But if you use the latest method, then this never happens. It's conserving energy at any resolution. So they allow without worrying about, about, about stability, because that's the code will conserve energy at any scale. Give you an example of one simulation that I'm going to show next. It's a simulation that uh, studies uh, space weather. And this particular simulation was run on SuperMOOC and it took 30,000 processors for 48 hours. This corresponds to about 1.5 million CPU hours. And uh, it give, gave us results. We published them on, on Nature Paper. We published them on Astrophysical Journal. So it's state-of-the-art simulation, one of the largest ever done in the world. Uh, if you were to do that simulation with the older codes, with IPIC3D, with IPIC3D, you have to remember that you have three spatial dimensions. So if you increase, the, if you if you have to put ten times more cells, you have to put ten to the third more cells because it's in X, Y, and in Z. And if you remove, if you reduce the cell size, you also have to reduce the time step because, of course, the CFL condition has to be satisfied. Otherwise, the particles will travel many cells on one time step. So you also have to reduce the time step. So that means that a factor of ten to the fourth goes into the increase of computational time and 10 to the 3 in the number of processors that you need. So this same simulation that I'm going to show you next would have taken 30 million processors instead of 30,000 processors. And it would have taken 15 billion computer CPU hours. Now, if you go even to the explicit method that requires, let's say, another 10 times more cells and more time steps, that would be uh, out of the question, like uh, 30 billion processors in 150 trillion hours. Of course, it's not possible. So I think to do the most uh, uh, challenging simulation, you know, not only you need the largest computers in the world, but you also need to go beyond the, the say, uh, brute force uh, methods. And you need to use something smarter, like the semi-implicit or the implicit methods. That's my, my main message when it comes to pick. That's kind of my career. So this is the example of the simulation that I, that I show you. Uh, this was done as a super MOOC in a previous uh, tier zero price uh, allocation that uh, we had last year. And uh, it shows uh, uh, the turbulent outflow from one of these uh, release of energy in space weather. And you see how complex the structure is. And you need all this resolution to, uh, to resolve it. Uh, but you don't need more resolution than that. If you had done this with uh, with the explicit method, like I said, it would have taken uh, 150 billion hours instead of 1.5 million. Um, you see there that energy conservation allows you with a much uh, coarser time resolution, time step of 0.1, to achieve the same results that you would have gotten 
in an explicit method using 100 times uh, more resolution. So, uh, like I said, uh, a tremendous number of computer hours. Now, the code is uh, based on this math matrix, and of course, that comes to the cost. Uh, the cost is that if you were to run an explicit method, you essentially would have only the, the light blue part of the calculation. You will have the mover. The field solver in an explicit method is very uh, small, let's say a few percent. But uh, in, an, in a semi implicit or implicit method, you have all these extra costs. The interpolations, the grid solution, which requires a linear solver, and uh, most importantly, the calculation of this famous mass matrix, which takes more than half of the time. But this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity because these operations based on the particles are very much suitable for GPUs. So uh, when you look at the scaling that was done here on SuperMOOC, you see that uh, at some point the, the, the particle motion and, uh, and the I.O. is perfect. I mean, you know, it, it couldn't scale better than this. But the construction of the mass matrix, which uh, together with the interpolations, uh, starts to uh, cost more and more as you increase the processor to, in this case, for 36,000. Uh, at, at that point, you need to, to start worrying about making that better. Uh, the field solver is also uh, not scaling perfectly, you see at the bottom one, but it is the most relatively small component still. But of course, if you were going to, to 300,000 or 3 million processors, then the field solver would start to be a problem and uh, improvements needs to be done. Uh, but the most important step that you can do at this point is take these blue operations that are very much parallelizable. They are essentially, uh, single operations from a particle to, to the grid, each particle uh, separately uh, being uh, treated, that can be done very efficiently on the GPU. So this is an example of a project that we have ongoing, a uh, deep project where uh, hybrid, uh, a computer uh, is, is uh, being uh, created uh, with uh, different parts, just like Lumi. Uh, where there are CPUs and uh, originally they were supposed to be mics from the Intel Xeon 5, but then Intel stopped producing them, so uh, we switched to the GPUs. And so we have already experimented on moving this operation that I mentioned uh, the, to the uh, GPUs. And you see there a comparison. At that time, we compared different types of GPUs with different types of mics from Intel. And as you can see, the mics were actually performing better in this particular operation. But of course, we were focusing more on the mics at that time. Now we are switching our focus to the GPUs. Uh, so uh, Lumi then presents a great opportunity in this direction because uh, with all this past experience, we can uh, use the CPUs for the grid-based operations where there is a lot of uh, uh, parallel communication for the field solver that requires uh, basically using uh, some uh, linear solver tool like a GMRS. Uh, and the GPUs. Uh, the GPUs can do the particle operations, the mover and the interpolations, including the mass matrix calculation, which is the lion's share of the, of the, of the computational cost, is let's say almost 80% of the cost will go to the GPUs. And uh, on top of that, the GPUs can also be used to do on the fly data analysis. And that's what I will show you next, because the on the fly data analysis is needed. This simulation save one time step, for example, uh, right now in the simulation that I show you, is several terabytes of data for the particle. So every time step, the code generates several terabytes of particle data. You cannot store and then later analyze several terabytes of that time for every time step, and there are maybe 100,000 time steps. So that would uh, reach a tremendous amount of, of, of data. Uh, so it, is, it needs to be done on the fly. And that's where the GPUs can come in again, because these analysis can be done using GPUs. And I'll show you some examples. So data analysis uh, uh, it is becoming also in space weather a top priority because there are these tremendously large simulations that produce a tremendous amount of information, but also the space missions are generating bigger and bigger data because they have more resolution and are pro producing more data, ground-based observations or also in situ space observations. So this is an example of what you can do with uh, data analysis uh, using machine learning. So uh, this simulation produces very large amount of data. For example, in this case, is uh, the simulation that I just showed you. Now you see the whole simulation. Before you were seeing only half of it. Uh, this simulation of, of currents within them, and we need to know where is the energy going. And to answer that question, here is the machine learning tool that selects uh, the regions with the highest currents uh, 
using uh, DB scan and then uses uh, the Gaussian mixture model to uh, identify to give the characteristics of each one of these uh, current layers and then look at the energy dissipation in them. And as you see, if you do that, you realize that only the smallest structures have the highest energy exchange. So it means that the energy is exchanged only when you reach down to very small scales, to the scales of the electrons. Energy then is exchanged primarily by the electrons that are uh, the main actor in this case. So this is this is a discovery to say that the concept of the simulation using machine learning to analyze the data, because if you have a, a human person should go in here and look at all the various currents and detect which one is what, what size it has, that's a lost cause. There are thousands here. But machine learning can do that. And it can do that on the fly. While the simulation is running, some GPUs can be used to do this. Uh, next example is uh, the distribution functions. As I mentioned, there are terabytes of data for each time step, even at this uh, level. When we will go to exascale, there will be even more uh, data for the particles. This is some data that, if you look at the literature, almost always is ignored because people focus on the fields which are manageable, but the particles are so many that nobody uh, has uh, the courage to start looking into that. That's why you need machine learning again, because machine learning can look at the distribution functions in each location and try to see what structure it has. This is an example of a distribution function in one location. As you can see, it's very complicated. It has several uh, clouds. Each one is maybe can be modeled as a Gaussian, uh, but, but there are very many of them. How many in each location will be a different number? Very complicated. So machine learning can help you. This is an example of a recent uh, work that we did in uh, making a, 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 a number of categories of uh, how many, uh, so it's a classification, how many classes of distribution, some of two, some of three, some of five or whatever, number of components. And uh, this is done automatically everywhere and, and, and the analysis can tell you where is that is more action is going on because more action means the distribution function is more complex. This is an example of the analysis done with this uh, machine learning technique. This is another example where you can use the same uh, type of approach using uh, machine learning to classify simulation uh, by location and um, detecting where you are in your system, which you can also use for a space mission to uh, tell a spacecraft where you are in the solar system. So uh, all these application of peak, like I mentioned, uh, are in my case for 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 uh, plasma physics, and that includes space weather, but it includes also many industrial and uh, fusion applications of plasma physics. But particle in cell is also applicable to many other cases. And variants of the particle in cell method uh, or, or systems where you have to deal with particles and with a, a field, computer on a grid, include many other cases. Here are some examples. The material point method is used for solid mechanics. You can study things like an automobile accident, for example with this method, or uh, you can see uh, the impact of a bullet on a bulletproof uh, surface. Uh, you can do cosmological simulations where now the particles will be uh, dark matter. You can do studies of biological systems where your particles are atoms, and the medium uh, is water. Uh, all the particles are immersed in water, and uh, the presence of water is a very important aspect. It's called solvation. Uh, doing the solvation properly is similar to solving peak. Uh, and finally, uh, a little bit of fun, uh, peak is now used also for special effects in movie. Uh, so if you look at the movie Frozen, the special effects where there was flowing water and uh, skating over ice, that's what, that was done with particle in cell. Uh, there is a special method called affine particle in cell method that was developed by the Disney Studios. So there is lots of application beyond the space weather that you can do with particle in cell. And uh, so I will just acknowledge that all this work was now with support from the European Union under the two projects, AIDA, where I'm the coordinator, and uh, Deep, uh, Deepest uh, coordinator is in ULIC. Uh, we are one of the members. Uh, also, we have support from NASA on the EU spheric support research. And most importantly for this uh, talk, a lot of computing uh, resources that we have had over the years from PRAISE, uh, several allocations over, over now many years we have had to be able to all do all these nice simulations. And then for smaller simulations also in Belgium from the Flemish supercomputer centers. And then uh, we have also used the code abroad. Uh, uh, our code uh, got the prize for one of the most uh, performance uh, code on the Tianhe 2 in China. 
we got the price. They tell me it's a price because it's all written in Chinese, but um, I, I'm, I'm led to believe that what they gave me was a price. And um, and then, of course, it's just a lot in the US also by our collaborations over there with NASA and also with the Department of Energy and NERSC Computing. Music